Okay, so this the second uh, talk will focus primarily on hive stocking density and pollinator supplementation in Washington blueberry. And again, with this, the experiments involved with this project, the sites uh, were in Western Washington. And there are a couple of reasons for that that, that I'll get into. Um, this project kind of piggybacked on one of Dr. DeVetter's projects looking at visitation in Eastern and Western Washington. And her finding that there was a reduced amount of honeybee visitation to blueberry flowers uh, in our region. And so just uh, by way of background, over 130 crops, including blueberry, rely on commercial honeybees for pollination. And again, we had reports of poor pollination uh, or a poor fruit set in particularly in Western Washington. And that, that's a primary driver for this project. Uh, and like I mentioned, Dr. DeVetter's study on visitation, um, the recommended rate is four to six bees per minute, or per bush per minute. And that's legitimate visits, bees that are pollinating flowers uh, rather than just bees that are just landing and flying away. And uh, what we'll kind of discuss what we saw in this study, but um, this prior project, it saw you know, around one bee per minute per bush um, versus this four to six bee um, recommendation. And so, First kind of a, a review on honeybees. Uh, Apis mellifera is the common agricultural pollinator. It's not native to North America. Uh, it's native to other regions of Northern Africa and the Mediterranean and Europe, uh, depending by the, the subspecies. Um, the subspecies that is the primary um, agricultural pollinator in the United States is um, Apis mellifera ligustica. And that's the Italian honeybee. And uh, it's, it's used primarily because of the almond industry where uh, Ligustica is, is very good at um, starting off strong in the spring, building a strong brood and a strong uh, hive environment um, that allows for uh, a high degree of foraging early in, this, in the spring, which is, which is what the almond industry uh, uh, needs. And so, that tends to be the, the available pollinator. There are other subspecies that, that uh, are out there, uh, particularly the Caucasian uh, honeybee, um, the Carniolan honeybee. These are, are two that are becoming more common as well as WSU has um, a bee breeding program that, that is looking at, at new crosses and there's new material being allowed into the US. So the outlook is good for um, sturdier, sturdier bees, and, and we'll talk about why that's important in the next couple slides. Um, weaknesses in Ligustica um, include poor foraging at low temperatures, and that's 55 degrees Fahrenheit and below, as well as in windy or windy conditions or rainy conditions. Uh, it doesn't do well when the weather is poor, and that is important because in Washington, especially Western Washington, we have pretty poor weather in that early spring period. Generally, cooler temperatures, a lot of rain, and so that makes it really difficult for these guys to pollinate blueberries. And so the alternative uh, is bumblebees, and many of the species of bumblebee are native to North America. This is important because our, these vaccinium species plants, our blueberries are native to North America, and Bumblebees have this, this um, co-evolution relationship with the honeybees to be more efficient pollinators of these flowers. Um, bumblebees tend to forage at lower temperatures and in windier and rainier conditions. And bumblebees can buzz pollinate or sonicate. And that's that vibrating of their wing flight muscles uh, to cause that pollen to shed out of the flower. Uh, bumblebees also have a longer average tongue length than honeybees and that enables access these tubular flowers, the nectar reserves are up at the base and it can be difficult for honeybees if they can't fit in to reach that, that nectar. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, we have a number of, of bumblebees that are native. In all of North America, there are approximately 46 species of bumblebee. 
Uh, and the most common commercially reared species is Bombus occidentalis. And this is a, an East Coast bee that is potentially harmful to native bumblebees in our area. We did not use occidentalis, even though it would have been uh, much more accessible because for, for this reason, that, that it is um, potentially damaging to those native pollinators that we want to encourage in our area to improve blueberry pollination. And so instead, um, we went with a native, um, a native species, this Bosnesensky, uh, which is available in our region. Um, we got them out of Olympia. Um, they are a strong native pollinator, and so it worked well for, for this project. So at Highbush Blueberry, the pollination window can be approximately seven to 12 days with viable pollen. Um, and then the stigma may be, may be receptive for as few as five days under less favorable conditions. And so if you've got this pollination window that's reduced under poor conditions to a uh, five to seven day period, if you have poor weather during that period and your honeybees aren't coming out of their hives, then this can result in, in poor, poor uh, fruit set. And that, that was what we're looking at primarily with this project. Um, so honeybees are adapted to pollinate plants that have um, a landing pad for them, larger petals that are flat where they can land on before they're foraging. Um, blueberries lack that landing pad and this can make it difficult for them to pollinate the flowers. If you've ever watched the bees on the blueberry flowers, they kind of stumble around, some of them fall off before they figure out how to get in there. And Bumblebees don't have the same problem. They can hook right onto the flower, very efficient at, at pollinating blueberries. Uh, and again, that has to do with their ability to buzz pollinate tongue lengths, uh, their ability to pollinate flowers that don't have that landing pad. So then looking at, at uh, the things that may be limiting pollination, I, I mentioned the weather and the issue that that may have on honeybees who are already disadvantaged with trying to pollinate a flower that is not um, been, a, that they're not adapted to pollinate. Um, a lack of, um, or poor hive health is also another issue. And we looked at that, uh, sorry, let me, we looked at, at hive health uh, in all of our trial sites, both in opening hives and observing um, the brood fill on frames, as well as watching entrances of the hives and counting the bees per minute that were coming or going. Um, the recommended hive density for, for blueberry is three to four hives per acre. And so that, that was our baseline uh, control density. So the objectives in this project were to compare current honeybee stocking densities, that three to four hives per acre, to high stocking densities, which we looked at eight hives per acre, and uh, then to measure subsequent effects on pollinator visitation, fruit set, estimated yield, and then attributes of berry quality in Western Washington. Uh, a secondary objective was to measure the potential benefits of pollinator supplementation with bumblebees uh, in commercial blueberry production. So we had 12 sites between these two uh, experiments. Um, six sites had, were for experiment one and six for experiment two. And uh, half of the sites were Duke and half of the sites were Draper. Um, so for, the, for experiment one was the supplemental pollinator experiment and we had three fields with three hives per acre of honeybees and three colonies per acre of these yellow-faced bumblebee, the Vosnesensky. Um, and then the other three fields, there is a typo there and they were only three hives of honeybees per acre in that experiment one um, control field. And then experiment two, uh, we had eight hives per acre in the high density treatment and four hives per acre in the control treatment. And we, we measured uh, visitation and foraging activity between 15 and 100% bloom. 
And then we measured during the hours of 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., which are primarily those foraging hours for honeybees. Um, we looked at 30 bushes per site, um, and they were split into three rows or three transects where we measured bushes throughout the row. Um, we only counted legitimate visits, so where the bee was actually pollinating the flower rather than just landing on them and moving on. And then uh, prior to doing our measurements on bee visitation, we evaluated colony strength by counting the number of incoming bees uh, within a colony in a minute. And this was both for bumblebees and for the honeybees. The bumblebee or the honeybee hives, we were able to open them up and to look at some of the frames. Uh, the bumblebee colonies come as a closed box. And so you can watch the entrance as a whole and you can see how many are coming and going. Um, and for a healthy colony, we were looking for one to two per minute coming and either out or in from the, from the colony. So the data collected was the same for both, both experiments and that included pollinator visitation rates, um, this hive strength rating, fruit set and uh, estimated yield, berry size and firmness, and then seed number per berry. And so the results of experiment one. Experiment one, there were some difficulties. It was the first year that we were trying to make the bumblebees work. And uh, the timing of bumblebee colonies um, was not ideal for pollination. We got them very late. Uh, and and the, the colonies that we use uh, come from queens that are captured early in spring. And then uh, the colonies are raised in captivity. And then what we get is a strong colony box for that time period. And these colonies were not, originally they had been planned on going on Duke, they were not ready in time. We, we put them on Draper, but they were still uh, fairly late in the season. And in working with um, the propagator for, of the bees, um, we think that when we repeat the study this next year, that the timing will be much better. Um, there are a lot of factors that I don't fully understand in getting those colonies to strength so they can go out in the field. Um, but it seems that, that that is just a wrinkle that needed worked out as far as timing um, and, and the feeding of the queen, the queen bees. Uh, so hive strength and flower visitation, going on to experiment two. So that experiment one, uh, you can see in the graph there, there were no significant differences between uh, our supplemental bumblebees and our honeybees, and that went for all of our, all of the, the, um, the measurements that we were taking. There was no significant differences across the board there. Um, in experiment two, uh, we saw uniform brood strength um, between sampled hives. Uh, we saw vegetation rates that were not significantly different, but tended to be increased with hive density. Uh, so you can see the visitation on that graph to the side, and it's not, it's not significant, <clears throat> but uh, it was very close. And the, when you separate the data out and show it by proximity to the hive, then we did see significant differences in visitation. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in some later slides. slides. Uh, we also saw significantly increased visitation rates uh, in those plots that were closest to the hive. So measuring, um, we measured the distance down the row uh, as well as the distance from the next closest hive. Uh, and then visitation rates even in high density trial sites were well below those recommended thresholds. And so as you can see there, um, I mean a tenth of the, the lowest you know, of, of the, the visitation rates from that previous study and well below that four bees per minute, uh, per bush per minute recommendation. Uh, fruit set and estimated yield. Um, again, not significantly different with the high density hives, but that trend of a higher fruit set, higher yield, um, the trend held in these sites as well. And then 
we had no difference in fruit firmness, um, regardless of treatment, but we did see significantly increased berry weight and seed number, which, which impacts that berry weight. Um, and that, that suggested to us that potentially there is um, increased pollination that, that may be going on. Um, and you can see in both these graphs that there, there was significance there. So in conclusion, um, the pollination conditions in 2016 were generally favorable and uh, that decreased the, uh, our, our ability to, to see these differences. Um, the Bombus Vosnesensky was difficult for propagators to rear in captivity and as a result, this timing colony maturity um, was, was difficult and led to um, insignificant results uh, in that supplemental pollination. And this is something we had looked at, there are companies like BioBest that, that have commercial bumblebees. Uh, generally, those are the Occidentalis um, species. And the outlook for there being native species for different regions is good. And so that, that's something that we're hopeful to have better timing next year. Um, hive densities led to increased flower visitation, fruit set, berry size, and estimated yield, uh, particularly significant increases in that berry size and seed number. And then as a point of interest, something that we'll be looking at more in depth next year is this observation that there's a positive relationship between the proximity of hives, the fruit set, and yield. Um, and there's the potential that the distribution of the hives as well as hive density may impact uh, fruit set. And so the outlook uh, for the future is one, that the cost benefits uh, analysis will be done at the end of 2017, kind of see if, there, if this is financially beneficial to add more hives based on what percentage of increase we are seeing of fruit set. Uh, we want to repeat experiments one and two, that's both the hive density and the supplementation, as well as add a component that looks at the potential for increasing these native habitat um, uh, in closer proximity to field conditions. And then uh, we also will be looking at attractants and pheromones and the potential that they have for increasing visitation and yield. And you can see in the bottom, pictures there and the bee scent is the one picture to the far right. Uh, these other two pictures are bumblebee colonies that we made to put out in some of the fields. Um, pretty simple construction and of the five that we put out, all five had native bumblebees that utilized them. Uh, with that, I'd just like to thank again the grower cooperators who made the project possible. Uh, Sue Kobe, uh, Sean Watkinson, uh, Belleville Bees, Bee Man Exterminators, who we got the bumblebees from, and then the funding agencies of Washington Blueberry Commission and Northwest Agricultural Research Foundation. So uh, thank you. And I got uh, about, about four, what do they call it, uh, uh, suggestions. Uh, number one, they, uh, I find that with that will be that they come up quite a bit earlier and so when you're putting on your pesticides to control like your worms and stuff, uh, there's quite a bit of a kill rate on the, on the bumblebee. Yeah, that, that's a great concern. And, uh, and that would be an advantage of putting out these commercial colonies was that you can kind of control when, when they go on. Um, that's a good concern for the habitat strips and potential uh, habitat construction as well. Uh, another thing that I noticed is that a uh, farmer ought to, ought to be thinking about raising about three or four different variety of plants so that way you have a certain amount of hives for, for, per acre, but uh, you get a whole lot more population of the bees going to the, the, the uh, blueberries that come into bloom. Yeah, that's, that's a, great, a great point as well. If it, it, where it was convenient, uh, different crops could definitely increase that biodiversity of pollinators. Uh, another thing that I noticed it like uh, I had, one time I had all my blueberries of about five different varieties all come into bloom, but I couldn't understand why uh, the bees weren't going to the uh, 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 to all the flowers. But it, but it turned out that 
and until that, that you could smell that pollen, the sweetness, that's when the bees went to it. Yeah, the bees are really efficient at knowing just when, when the flowers are ready for them. Uh, I, one, one other thing is that I noticed that I, one year I decided I was going to be real cheap and not, not put any bees in. I'll get by with the native bees that we had. And it turned out that we went out and you could strike the, the blueberry plant and 80% of all those berries, because they didn't get pollinated, fell on the ground. Yep, yep. Hi. Um, I was just wondering did I, if I missed it or not. Did you have fields just with bumblebees and no we, honeybees? We didn't have fields just with, with bumblebees, only the, only the supplementation to the honeybees. I have a question for you. Uh, you said, well, obviously with the increased uh, amount of bees, hives per acre, you're going to have increased fruit set, and that's something that's fairly common we see in our, in our cherries as well. But one of the things I was curious about is your observations about additional uh, berries were set, but also you had increased berry size. Could you elaborate on that, please? Yeah. Uh, so, and, and that is likely connected to that increased uh, number of seeds per berry. Uh, there's, there's a well-documented connection between the seeds per berry and that berry weight, and that has to do with the hormones that, that are coming off of the seeds uh, as they develop. And uh, as, as we look at pollinating to saturation and a saturating level of pollen grains on the stigma uh, leading to you know, this higher number of, of seeds in the berry, that, that's where we're thinking that size Would that, comes from. Could that potentially uh, transpire because of more than one visit by on that? Yeah, de definitely could. Any other questions for Matt? Well, let's thank Matt for sticking out for almost an hour. <laughs> okay, we're going to... We're going to take a little break, and then we have our two keynotes at 11 o'clock in this room. So grab some coffee, uh, some breakfast, and meet back in here at 11. Oh, and yes, turn in your surveys at either table on either side, at either exit in this room. <laughs>